Well, good morning and a welcome to our service this morning. Um, we're few in numbers, but that does not matter because people, um, there's some fear out there still about um, uh, the COVID and the problems that uh, we might have with contagion. And a lot of our people self-isolate and they've chosen not to be here this morning. Um, uh, we're going to begin, uh, and I want to welcome our special guests, jo Jim and Joanne uh, from uh, uh, One Hope Canada, from Three Hills. Great to have you here. And Dennis Stun, where is he? There at the back. And he's from Canadian Baptist of Western Canada, and he'll be sharing with us as well. So Jim and Joanne, welcome. And uh, we'll be praying for you as you'll be making your move to Africa fairly soon and trust that things will be uh, coming together there. And uh, thank you for all you, your help here in uh, uh, the transition process that we've really appreciated all your help and encouragement for that. And thank you too, Dennis, for your help in assisting us in a new de denomination and we look forward to hearing from you a little later on. I'm going to begin this morning with a reading from Psalm 89. And by the way, if you want to come up here, we've got this screen in front of you. Take your mask off, uh, those of you who will be coming up. All right. So Psalm 89. And I'm going to read the first eight or so verses. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I'll make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I'll establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord or God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. Join me in prayer, please. Oh, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this day, and especially we want to thank you for your faithfulness to us. We want to thank for, for your faithfulness to mankind in that you have not left us without hope in this world, but you have given to us Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that we can open our minds and our hearts to Jesus' love and his grace and his mercies that are new every morning to us. Grant, Lord, that we might indeed be your servants in the places where you've called us to be. We thank you for this opportunity of worship today as we've gathered together and pray that as we worship you, that our thoughts and our minds um, would be acceptable in your sight, uh, our Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And so bless us now as we've assembled together and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so delighted to have uh, Jim and Joanna with us today. And uh, Jim, I, uh, it's great to have you here and thank you for all the work you've done on behalf of this congregation. Uh, we thank you for all the work you've done uh, in, as the church transition coordinator and before that, uh, working alongside uh, Gloria and uh, and uh, oh, I've got Cliff. Hey, Cliff. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria and Cliff. Um, it, when uh, you were working uh, with the camps and the churches at the same time, so we're delighted to have you here and come and share with us what the Lord has put on you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, just this 
summer we were out in BC and I had a chance to visit with Cliff and Gloria and uh, we talked about this Sunday was coming up and so they are sending their warm friendship and greetings to the congregation here and on this occasion so uh, so they really are thinking about us and also praying as well now uh, also uh, just since I was uh, here and greeted so warmly by various ones uh, keeps coming up about uh, our pending trip maybe to Kenya and uh, I thought I would just mention a couple things about that just uh, because some of you weren't in on those conversations but uh, just a little bit of personal history with Joanna and I uh, we spent 26 years with Africa Inland Mission and primarily focused on Rift Valley Academy uh, a missionary kids school and we actually spent about 20 years at Rift Valley Academy and raised our children there. And then it was 2010 that uh, we felt the Lord was moving us back to Canada to stay, and in particular Alberta. And so that's what we thought life was. And then all of a sudden, uh, Cliff Peterson gets a hold of me and talks me into joining CSSM. And uh, so we joined back there in 2010 and uh, of course spent 10 years. And uh, even when I agreed to uh, join that mission, I said, well, at my age, I'll give you maybe five years. I hope that that's what it'll be. Well, of course, 10 years, and here I'm even beyond that now, and, and still, in a sense, representing uh, One Hope Canada. Uh, yes, I was even in on the name change uh, from CSSM uh, to One Hope Canada. So whether that's a good thing or not, you can certainly blame me as part of that committee <laughs> that was on that. So, but it was just part of that renewal process that we went through. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, as a mission, we uh, have found it very difficult actually to take the 12 churches we had here in Alberta. And uh, most of them have gone with the AGC. And uh, you have elected here to go with the Baptists. And by the way, I'm okay with that because jo <laughs> Joanna and I are Baptist in our background and uh, we're definitely okay with that. So uh, I was thinking about what to uh, uh, share with you because we certainly as One Hope Canada wish you very well and we are very pleased that it's uh, the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada that uh, you are becoming part of. Uh, that is just great. Uh, you see, the thing is, Longview uh, uh, as a community, it's a hard place spiritually, isn't it? Like the whole area. Yeah. And yet you guys are that beacon of light here. And it, it makes me wonder, well, how does, uh, how do we minister, you know, in, in a situation like this? And uh, that question came up a, a while back with us as a mission. And we just thought, you know, there has to be uh, a pastor couple placed here that just ooze out God's love all the time. Now I don't know what you think of uh, Gil and Andrea, but did we get the right people here? Amen. 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 Yes, we did. And uh, they have done just that. And the way the community is so uh, uh, connected with the church and seems to think very good things about the church and I know we had that bump there a few years back where I, I can hardly believe that we are in this position today. And uh, so how do we minister? Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd like to, uh, to just refer to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, the first 10 verses. And I've got a whiteboard here, which I would like to use as well, uh, showing you a bit of my artwork. <laughs> okay. Now, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but... What I'm sharing with you is uh, something I just think it's good for people who are involved in church life and in, uh, and in Christian ministry. Like, it's just something that's really helpful. And uh, I first came across this idea about a year back when I was out at Miller College of Bible. And a speaker there was speaking on this passage. And he started drawing some things. And I'm going to share uh, some of those drawings with you that really... I've never forgotten it. It's just, it's been very, very helpful. And so when we look at Ephesians chapter 2, first of all, just the first four verses, it describes what we would call a non-believer. 
So it says there, uh, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Uh, okay, so uh, that uh, first part just talks about somebody who is a non-believer. Okay, so uh, let me just see if I can get you to see what I'm putting up here. And I'm going to draw a picture of a non-believer. Okay, are you ready for this? Like I hope so anyway. That's what a non-believer looks like, obviously, symbolically, okay? <laughs> and uh, I want you to think of uh, three zones here. And uh, what's the mindset of a, a person who doesn't know the Lord? Well, what they do is they do stuff. They be, have certain behaviors, and I'm writing the word perform here, okay? It just means the person's actions and uh, and their their thoughts and just uh, their idea of what's what's the things to do. And uh, if they perform well, first of all, it's about their self-esteem. They might feel good. Okay, they might feel good about themselves, but you know, even then, so far, that's kind of a picture of a non-believer. You might say, well, maybe God should be in this spot up here, but it isn't in their lives. And by the way, uh, there are some people who don't feel good about themselves at all. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't like how they're living. They don't like their own behavior. They don't even like themselves. And that's sad. And I'm sure around Longview and area, there are people like that you could even think of. And, uh, and so sometimes that's just all there is to who they are. But then there are other people too, they're, they're non-believers, but you have to admit, they're good, good people. You know, they do lots of neat things. Uh, they might be on the Chamber of Commerce for Longview and uh, very interested in serving the community and, and so on. Uh, I know, Andrea, you're involved with Meals on Wheels and maybe some of those people are not even believers who are part of that. And they just uh, want to help their uh, their neighbors and so what they may be doing is trying to get uh, I'll just say people's approval And so even a good good person maybe that's all they want to do is uh, Just you know please other people and uh, again it helps them with their own self-esteem to feel better but that's kind of what a non-believer is like, okay? And uh, I want you to hang on to that idea. I'm going to erase it, and then I'm going to show you a, a, a bit of an altered view of things. All right? We know that our passage in Ephesians goes on, and from verse 4 onward, if we read a bit more, says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgress in transgressions. And it is by grace you have been saved. Now, we could read on, but we realize that we are saved, right? And so let's uh, just talk about maybe, uh, I'll say, an immature believer. These pictures have really helped me to understand ministry a whole lot better. And an immature believer might look a bit like this. Okay. And again, they got the three parts here. And so uh, down here, of course, they're going to do certain things. And they want to behave, at, you know, like in church or, you know, in the Christian community. Uh, they want to behave a certain way. And they do that so that they can feel good. So it just looks like the other diagram almost. You know, but people want to feel good about themselves. And uh, why are they doing all of that? Well, 
They want to get God's approval. Not the approval of other people necessarily, but they want to get God's approval. Okay? And uh, there are a lot of Christians who are at that point. And uh, I want to point out something about this. This is almost like a works worldview, isn't it? Yeah. You have to earn God's approval. You have to do stuff. And, uh, and maybe you'll feel good when you do enough good works and that sort of thing. And then, you know, to try and gain God's approval. But, you know, uh, I've been out in Africa and I've met people who are animists. And what are they doing? They're sacrificing, you know, they do certain things, you know, uh, in order to uh, somehow please this unknown God or the gods or whatever way they're putting it. Um, we also got to meet a tremendous number of uh, Muslim people out in Africa. And that's another thing they do. Like if you want help, and I'm talking about it, as a Christian, we were even told this as missionaries out there, if you had a car breakdown or whatever, find a Muslim person, you're going to get help. And it may sound really crazy, but they, they, their whole thing is do a whole bunch of good works so that it outweighs your bad so that then this unknown God will accept you, you know, into eternity or whatever. And that's kind of the uh, picture that they have. The thing that makes me sad is, as a Canadian, I just feel like so many Christians are stuck in this worldview. And uh, even some of our young people, we talked about the idea, sh uh, the idea of why do some young people abandon their faith, you know? And I think part of it is, that, uh, you know, they do the church kind of things and uh, they're hoping that they all feel good about themselves if they do that. But they just feel like they just have to work to, to please a God that they're not even sure is there, perhaps even. They might just have that mindset. And so, and then of course, they'll go to university or wherever and, and people are just telling them, uh, well, that's, that's all life's about. You know, you should do a little bit of good in your life and, uh, and that way you can feel good about yourself. And then, uh, you know, the world, a uh, university tells you, just like my previous diagram, that, well, that way all sorts of other people will think you're a good guy or a good, or a good woman or whatever the situation is. But that's what an immature believer does, all right? So I want you to keep that in mind. And then uh, we're going to read on and uh, just finish out the passage here because I, I want to keep this relatively short. Um, yeah, jumping ahead to verse 6 and following. And it says here, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Notice that, by grace we've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, notice that, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ, Christ Jesus to good, do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, that gives us a different picture of what it is. Like what's, what's a, well, let's call it a mature believer. Let's just say, what does a mature believer look like? And it's quite a different diagram. First of all, it'll look like this. And when you accept Christ, you've got God's approval. Is it by works? No. You've got God's approval right off the bat. When God sees you, he sees you as a forgiven sinner and that you are clean and, and very acceptable. And that's what God sees when he looks at, at a believer. And of course, the idea is that uh, you'll probably feel good about yourself, like you'll be fulfilled. Sorry about my writing there. Okay. And then what happens up here? Well, we'll call it good works. So,
does this mean that, uh, you know, like I, I've been a missionary now for uh, 36 years, something like that. And, you know, that's maybe a lot of good works. Well, does that affect how God thinks of me? And the answer is no. He loves us all. He, he loves that uh, young person who accepted Christ a week ago. You know, that sort of thing. And, and he really couldn't love him anymore. Like it's, in other words, we don't have to do good works to impress God. So why do we do good works? Well, it just pours out of the fact that we know we have God's approval. You know, I, I taught school, uh, high school for years, you know, as math and science uh, teacher and everything. And uh, one thing I really learned is that uh, kids are people that uh, have feelings and emotions. And if you just expect the best out of them, they'll work really hard for you. But if you have the opposite view and just say, oh, you're just green behind the ears, you know, you don't know anything. And you kind of have that, that condescending attitude toward them or that sort of thing, you get nowhere. And I just found, uh, my wife and I have really proven that over and over again at Riffelli Academy as, as one example, where you just expect the best of kids and they just rise to the occasion. They just do that. And that motivates actually all of us. It's not just students, it's, it's all of us. And so the idea is, God already loves us to pieces, you know? And so that's the way we should look at, at life, all right? But uh, I wonder if I can squeeze this in. There is one thing, I'll just put a line across here, and then I'm going to just try to draw another little angle down here, and see if I can get it in there. But what this is about is sometimes Christians who have been Christians a long time, they get kind of judgmental, and so they kind of create a whole new diagram here. And so, uh, what they do is they, like uh, God may be looking at a person like this, but what the judgmental person is doing is setting the triangle upside down, and they're just uh, back here again where it's perform. Sorry. And, uh, you know, that's what uh, a, a Christian's looking at another Christian. You know, like I, I want to look at how they dress, how they speak, how they behave. Are uh, they using rough language or not? You know, all the different things that go on. And so they look at that, and so it's not about feeling good here. It's, uh, I'll just say, it's, uh, I don't know how to characterize it, my approval, you know, for that other believer. In other words, they have to earn my approval. And then, if they pass my approval, then they're acceptable to God. And these, uh, this is the only diagrams I'm just going to show you with this, but it sure helps to understand the nature of the issues that go on. And uh, what happens? What's going to drive a, a young person away from believing in the Lord? It's this attitude that a church could have or Christians could have where their worth depends on their performance and uh, that kind of thing. I remember at one time our youngest daughter had kind of a crisis going on in her life and our youngest daughter was one of these high end, like I mean top of her class academic kind of persons and uh, she was all stressed out because she was kind of unprepared for a test or something one day and, uh, and we wondered why she was in such an emotional state and so we started asking her about it, and to make a long story short, what she thought is if she didn't get 100% in that test, that Joanna and I may not love her very much. Okay? It was very real to her. And so we actually had quite a conversation saying that her worth wasn't involved with her performance. You see, it's more like this picture, instead of God's approval, like, she's our daughter, we just love her unconditionally. That's kind of what it was like. And so, again, we have to tell young people that. All right? It's not about you have to do this 
so that we as a staff at the school will give our approval so that then you'll be acceptable to God, you know. This is, like I say, that's like poison. It's toxic. And uh, unfortunately, it's so prevalent in the church today. And I think you guys can identify with that. But just remember, you know, when you're ministering to Longview and area, I'm just talking about, you know, when somebody accepts Christ, they got God's approval. There's nothing more that they could do to earn, say, your approval. You should look at it the same way God does. And just say, yeah, I know they're a young Christian or something like that. But just love them in the Lord. You know, there they are. And, uh, of course, as we disciple them in that, we'll start to see the good works coming out. You know, that sort of thing. But it, it really helps when you uh, think of doing ministry. Okay. Why don't we just pray for a moment and uh, then we'll be done here. Okay. Heavenly Father, uh, as I've read this Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10, Lord, it's just helped me to understand more and more about what it is that goes on in people's minds, what their, their mindset is. And I pray, Lord, that we can have a healthy view, uh, like this right side up triangle where we recognize that we just belong to you and and that is what we need to concentrate on and of course as we absorb the whole meaning of that we'll be doing good things Lord because you prepared us for good works you have a plan for us and I just pray Lord that we will discover that Lord we particularly lift up our young people our younger generation that faces this uh, extremely secularized world and I just pray Lord that uh, we can ground our young people in in faith so that they understand who they are in Christ and I just pray that we can get away from this idea of performing and having to do good works to impress others Lord again just help us to rely on Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 10 and realize that we belong to you because of your grace you gave this gift to us and we don't have to earn it. Lord, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so great to have you with us. And do come. And uh, Dennis is being very, very helpful and going and helping us go through the process of trans trans uh, transitioning to the new denomination. And so we're grateful for that, Dennis. And just take whatever time you need and so on as you share. So, okay. Thank you so much. And Dennis is the field director for the Canadian Banks of Western Canada. I'm sorry I don't have fancy drawings <laughs> for you today. Uh, Jim, thanks so much. That was a good, good way to look at the text and a good encouragement to all of us. And I want to thank One Hope Canada for looking after this church for the years and helping them financially, helping them with their pastors and things like that. I um, appreciate that. And you've, you've, been, you've been great. And if... Um, if you want another job, if you can't get to um, <clears throat> Kenya, uh, talk to me. I got some places where we could probably plug you in. So, uh, boy, especially if you got a Baptist background. <laughs> um, so, anyhow, I want to give greetings to you from our executive staff of our of our Canadian Baptist Western Canada, which is about ten different people that are in different offices from uh, Winnipeg all the way up to Victoria and stuff like that. And um, we have a board that meets online right now and they're from as far as Yellowknife to uh, Weyburn and all these things. So, um, you know, your, your representatives are from all over the place and our churches are from all over the place. Like we have some that are very rural, more like this one, which is more like what I was raised with. I, I love coming here because it's very much uh, similar to where I grew up. Uh, but then we have some that are downtown Vancouver and ministry's got to look different in different places. And so the denomination doesn't tell the church what to do. You know, we're here to help the church do what they feel they're supposed to do. And that's, um, that's mostly how we're arranged. I want to tell you as well, our executive minister uh, is in Vancouver, but is moving to Calgary, has bought a place there. So he's going to move be right next door to you just over here. Uh, his wife, Bonnie, is actually from Atasca and she's an Alberta girl as well. So. Uh, we're going to have even more representation here in Alberta in the coming season. They'll probably move in January, I think it is, something like that. Um, his wife is a nurse who works in, I think, um, you know, more of the emergency care in a hospital in, uh, in Vancouver. So she's on term until probably the next year. I was looking at your 
website online. One of the things you kind of emphasize on the website is that we're not denominational. Uh, so here we are talking about joining a denomination. And I want to say if there's a denomination that's not denominational, really it's similar to the CBWC, whatever it is. And there's not really that much difference between where you've been and where you're headed with the CBWC. And people that come to our churches come from all sorts of denominations. People that come as pastors, they come from all sorts of denominations. We get pastors from Christian Reform, Pentecostal, everywhere in between. So it's not like we have a form that everybody has to follow. So you are responsible, your uh, board, whatever, whatever you elect, you're going to be able to make your own choices. Um, and other than that, we're pretty well, pretty standard. Evangelical church believes in scripture, believes in Jesus, believes in the gospel. Uh, things you'll find with us are true elsewhere. Uh, but we have various benefits to offer a church. We you know, we'll credential your pastors. We involve training for your pastors, even with some funding. And you're connected to pastors' conferences, assemblies, where representatives from here can go and vote on various things. You get newsletters with information. Right now, there's lots of newsletter um, newsletter information online with us on how to reply as a church on a COVID situation and different examples from different churches there. There's newsletters from our church planning group that tells you some of the things that are going on church planting-wise. Um, I might as well speak to that for a moment. Uh, again, I said this, I think, in the foyer. We have 10 different worshiping communities in Alberta that do not worship in English. So uh, we are on the forefront of church planting with all sorts of different groups. So I'm learning all sorts of things with all sorts of cultures. So we have Spanish, we have Japanese, we have two different churches from Myanmar. We have people from, you know, various Congo is another one, Congolese. Like we just have a number of groups that we're helping support from the ground up as they get started. Uh, some of which are are large, and some of those are smaller groups just getting started, trying to reach their own uh, group. Which actually, as we think of how our groups grew across Canada, it was often we started as an ethnic group. You know, there was the German Baptist, there was the Swedish Baptist. I mean, we came, you know, Ukrainian Baptist. We, we came and we grouped in our ethnic group, and then we grew out of that to become more Canadian. And that's the same with these groups. So it's kind of a way to link back in is to work with some of these groups. So I'll just mention that. Um, we have resources for, of course, your financial processes for your treasurer, people to call, people to work with government and governmental systems, get clarity on various things relating to you know, what's appropriate for churches. And of course, you're networking with about 170 other cha churches in Western Canada, working with over 400 pastors and chaplains. And you have access to people like myself as a regional minister. You have access to you know, a church planning director, uh, working with uh, other settings like that, and we're involved in sharing stories with one another, sharing the good stories with one another. Like as a member church in the CBWC, one of your partner churches is a church in northern Vancouver. It is an Iranian church that had 142 baptisms so far this year, and I think it was over 300 last year. I mean, there are some phenomenal stories out there. So um, God is at work still among us. So that's just something that's really exciting. And you're involved in missions around the world through our Canadian Baptist Missions Group. So, by the way, Jim, did you know um, Chris and Myrna McClure? Very well. I thought maybe, yeah. When you started mentioning where you've ministered, I thought, I'll bet you know this guy. So, he's one of our pastors. So, you know, it's a small world when you get into the Christian world sometimes. So, good guy. He's getting ordained, actually, and with us coming up here next week, week after next. So, come a long ways. Yeah, yeah quite a story there. Anyhow, um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about Scripture as well, and I want to talk about Psalm 84 is where I'm going. Um, when uh, Gil turned to Psalm 89, I was wondering if he was going to steal some thunder from me, but uh, not quite. So, uh, Psalm 84 is written by the sons of Korah and the descendants of Korah. Uh, depends which version you have. And... Uh, Korah was a person who rebelled against Moses and had a number of followers at the time when they were in the wilderness for those 40 years. So Korah had about 250 people following him at the time. And if you know that part of the story, what's interesting is, um, you know, God said, get away from these people. This is bad news, basically. So they, they got away from him, separated from these people, which included very prominent members of the assembly, is what it says in number 16. 
And God just had the earth open up and swallow them. 250 people, just gone. But that did not end the problem that they had because there was this murmuring and grumbling that was taking place against Moses. And so it's during that period of time where God allowed um, Aaron's rod, his staff, to bud. You know the story of that? So it showed God's approval of Aaron and the Levite system there. Um, but Korah was a Levite as well. So it's just interesting how some of that happened. Uh, but eventually there's, it says 14,000 people that uh, got a plague because they were still grumbling and murmuring against Moses. So the story goes on about that. And, um, but Moses proved you know, himself and his worth by this dead branch kind of blooming and stuff. And then it gets put in the uh, Ark of the Covenant, I believe. So, I mean, it's, it's quite something. It's kept forever. Maybe we'll see it yet again. Who knows? Uh, but eventually, 14,000 people kind of have to be turned around from the direction they're going and they're murmuring and grumbling to coming on board with where Moses was. And of course, you consider the people that had come out of Egypt in a very short period of time. They had a transition from that culture, uh, that food, that treatment, their sense of identity and who they were. Uh, all of that, the law of God was given, the Ten Commandments, like they were shifting all over the place in terms of how things were, were gonna go forward. But in the middle of that, Korah is killed. What is interesting is 10 chapters later in the book of Numbers, what you find out is that the children of Korah were not killed. So it makes you wonder, did they follow their dad or did they not? Or were they sitting on the sideline? And, and we don't know that story. I can only make up uh, possible scenarios of what that was really like for them. But the descendants of Korah were not killed. And they were given specific duties in the temple. I mean, they were Levites. And so what you have is some of them were gatekeepers. Some of them learned to be bakers, what we read in the scripture. And some of them were leading in worship and writing scripture like you have here and singing as well. Uh, in the story later on in the scriptures, you have the story of Jehoshaphat, who's facing three different countries that have merged together in a treaty and they're going to fight against Judah. And so they gather and they're just highly outnumbering the people of Judah and the people of Judah gather. And uh, prophet says, hey, let's just start singing and praising God. You know, whatever's going to happen almost, but, you know, belief that God's going to assist them. And so they just start singing and praising God. And who's leading them but the descendants of Korah? You know, they just start singing. All of a sudden, it's like song instead of stress and worry over, are we going to die out there? And that's a whole different story about how they go out and God scattered the enemies. They're not even there when they go out there and they just collect the things that are left behind and they kind of get rich on the proceeds. It's, it's kind of an interesting story. But it's the descendants of Korah that are brave enough and uh, strong enough in the Lord their God that they start singing. So Psalm 84 is one of these psalms, one of these 11 psalms that they wrote. And actually, you know, you go through this, um, these 11 psalms and are really quite wonderful. Some of them are the most loved ones that we have today. It's like, uh, you know, as the deer pants for the stream, so my, you know, so my soul longs after you, if you know that one, or the song, or the chorus, whatever. Um, that's one of their psalms. And there's some other ones, the ones about, you know, if the mountains break up and fall into the sea. I mean, that, there's that. I mean, a lot of them were from the sons of Korah because they really linked themselves to worshiping God. And um, I just want to talk about this psalm and you and then relate a little bit more to the descendants of Korah and then and we're going to call it a morning here. But let me just read Psalm 84 for you. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I'm reading from the New Living Version, so it's going to be a little different than yours, but it's okay. That's, uh, it's a translation. It's not a paraphrase. And I want you to know that uh, there's quite an emphasis here upon the temple. And I want you to think of that in terms of this building. Not that the church is a building, because it's not. I mean, the church today has to meet in different ways because of COVID and stuff. There's just various ways that the church is still finding ways to worship together, but it's a privilege to have a place to go, and you have that here in Longview, and we just want to support that. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. Again, a statement about the building and the place of the temple back then. 
With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar. I could say that around here. There's lots of sparrows in your trees, right? So, um, O oh Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. Thinking of the birds singing, thinking of you guys singing, thinking of this place again. Like, it's a precious thing to have a place. I mean, and, and what we're doing, you know, we're just coming alongside what God's already done through those of faith who've been here and uh, honored the scriptures and honored God and sung in praise. Like, you're just extending that now going forward, and we just want to encourage that. Um, what joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Of course, being in Jerusalem, they watched all these people coming and going as they did every year from all around the world at that time uh, to the temple to worship God. Uh, when they walked to the Valley of Weeping, it would become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessing. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. Again, the pilgrimage part of this, uh, very important to them. Verse 8, O Lord God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. O God, look with favor. And my computer just went nuts here. Um, O oh, oh God, look with favor upon the king our shield. Show favor to the one you have anointed. A single day in your courts. Again, that's a phrase close to the temple. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those that do what is right. O oh, Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. Like, isn't that a great psalm? Yeah. It's a psalm about the temple and, you know, place of worship. And I'm not saying that this psalm fits exactly church building or anything like that, but I just want to say that it's great to have a place. And it's great to meet with other people who want to um, uh, just live in the presence of the Lord their God. But just think about the descendants of Korah for a moment. I can totally imagine without stretching it too far. I'm sure they, early on, they lived with, a, lived with their negative past. They had a history. They had a father or a grandfather, a great-grandfather, whatever it is, at some point, who had this history that rebelled against Moses. It's kind of like having that family member that, you know, you'd rather wasn't a part of your family maybe in your past. Um, and um, they probably lived, lived with some undeserved shame. And maybe it wasn't there. They're, they're children of Korah. You know, it's, it's like I can imagine that it's, it's just interesting. That would be a stigma. But what I've found as well is people who have um, that kind of past sometimes are the ones that when they come to God and they realize God's total acceptance of us, God's total approval of us, that God just loves us and we start with that acceptance, that they're the ones who respond the most to God. They, they give their whole heart because they know what it's like to be on the other side where they feel judged, where they feel like they're worthless, where they feel undeserving. But here are these people that out of, out of the transition from their father's past, they've seen what God has done, they walked with Israel through the rest of the 40 years, they entered in, they saw the, the establishment in the land of Judah and Israel, and they saw that, and they saw the works of God, and they saw the building of the temple. These are the people that God used greatly, uh, actually in the years to come, like I mentioned during the time of Jehoshaphat. Uh, you are a worshiping community, and you're blessed to have this place. A building is not essential for the work of God, but it is a handy tool that you have, and it's a light, as Jim shared, it's a light to this community uh, that something's going on as people meet and worship God. So we want to assist you in that. We want to come alongside you. We want you to collect other believers alongside you and help you in terms of your, of your outreach. So just in that vein, I just want to mention one more thing, and I'm going to step away. Um, a little over a year ago, God impressed in my heart. Um, the great commandment that Jesus gave. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, COVID's been a good season for me to do this. I've emphasized my neighbors as my ministry. I mean, I do go to a church in Edmonton, but I mean, I'm all over the place in my travels. So I've kind of emphasized personally my neighbors. 
And this year, I think because I made that a prayer, um, God has just opened my door with my neighbors. I've lived there about 10 years. And you know, a lot of our neighbors, they come home and they live in a big city and they push the garage door opener, they drive in, they push the garage door opener, you never see them. <laughs> and that's how a lot of people are in the city. I mean, you have privileges sometimes in a rural area because you interrelate actually more. Uh, I learned pastoring in a more rural community that actually funerals are larger in a rural area than they are in the city because you're more interconnected, uh, just to say that. You have, you have great privileges. You can actually get uh, close to your neighbors much easier than it is in the city. But for me in my city, my next door neighbor is from the Punjab. My, he can't fix anything. And I'm fairly mechanical. So he and his wife, they're always coming over. Can you help us? Our faucet's leaking, or this doesn't work. My garage door doesn't work, and I'm always there. And I've just gotten to know him really, really well. It's really great. And on the other side is a neighbor who, who works with landscaping, which uh, is, is interesting enough. You know, we, we talk very friendly, like, all the time. Um, and on both sides, I get offered booze. I don't know why that is, but yeah, that's a totally different story. Uh, but anyhow, my neighbor on the other side, he phones me up. Two weeks ago, I think it was. He says, I've got a guy who works for me. I really like him. I really want to keep him. But he says the home in which they live basically has a demon. Can you help him? And so this is my conversation start with my neighbor. We talked about this again last night. Uh, and it's like, here's a spiritual conversation started out of nowhere. And there's this other guy who lives about five or six houses down the road. And he's traveling away. He's going to go see family in Manitoba. And he comes to me and says, here's the key to my house. You know, if the security system goes off, would you go down and check on things? Uh, and it's like, I'm fair distance from where he is, but we've talked along the street, they walk their dog and we stop and chat. And all of a sudden there's this relationship and level of trust. Where did that come from? And I, you know, I think it's God allows us to minister to our neighbors. <laughs> And it's like, I think that really is where this church needs to start. You know, it's, it's loving the people that are around you. It's not loving the people far away. I mean, yes, you want to love them too, but practical ways of just loving your neighbors and see where the conversation opens up. So I'll just share that. You know, God has been good to me, and I know he's been good to you, and it's going to be a privilege having you as part of the Canadian Baptist Western Canada. I welcome you on behalf of the whole team and our sister churches, and we look forward to the years ahead and what God might do. I'm going to be here afterwards. You want to talk to me, ask me questions, but I, I trust today just hearing from Jim and hearing from Psalm 84 that you're encouraged about your church family. God bless you all. Thank you, brother. Isn't it good to have family from all over the place and, and to have these sort of connections that we can have, you know, with other people? And isn't it good to hear how the Lord is working with other cultures here in Canada um, through the denomination that we had? And that happened actually in um, Ontario and Quebec too. I think it was one of the most multicultural denominations around at the time when I began ministry um, uh, in a church plant in Toronto. So it, it's a wonderful thing to have this spirit that joins us together and, and enables us to minister and reach out um, uh, from where we are uh, to what God wants us to do. So let's find our neighbours and let's minister to them as uh, uh, Dennis has encouraged us. And thank you so much, Jim, for letting us think through this uh, scenario again that you presented to us. So we really appreciate that. And we appreciate both of you gentlemen in the way that you've assisted and enabled us in this transition time. And God bless you both in your continuing ministries, um, in your different uh, aspects uh, as you go, um, uh, as we leave uh, from here. Lord, Lord, that's our prayer, that we might be united together in godly love, that we might see our neighbors as you see them, that we might reach out with minds of, and hearts of compassion and love to them, that we may do practical things to enable them to have better lives, and more importantly, that they might find Jesus as they see Jesus in us. 
Oh Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love for us. And Lord, as we go from this place, may we be faithful and loyal to you in the things that you've entrusted to us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.